Hello students, I hope you're having a nice fall break, or if, depending on when you're watching this, had a nice fall break. So I hopefully this should be able to work okay, and if it doesn't I'm not going to hold it against you for sure. So hopefully all this will work correctly and we'll get through this quickly and it'll be a good use of everybody's time. So I wanted to start by finishing up our lecture that we were not quite done with last time, and that lecture was about the Seven Years' War. And the Seven Years' War is really important because one of the things that it does is it sets up our new world system. It sets up our new world order in a way. And if you remember, the lo when we left last time, we were looking at William Pitt's way of war. We were talking about his new way of waging war and why he was more effective at winning the war from a sort of administrative perspective. This is one of the things that helped him in an administrative role. But actually on the ground, these two guys are really important. These are two generals that get sent from, respectively, the French and the British side. Montcalm is French and Wolfe is British, in case you couldn't tell by their names. And they have a lot, just as much, if perhaps not more, to do with why the war goes the way it does. Now, Montcalm, like we mentioned, fought in a lot of these wars for empire that we talked about, these big wars that went on in Europe, and they fought in kind of this traditional European way. And Montcalm had been part of that tradition. So when he gets over to America, he expects to fight the same way. More importantly, he expects his Native American allies to fight the same way. He gets the natives to essentially line up in a big formation, gives them guns, and says, you're going to stand in a line, you're going to shoot at this other line of people. Well, that's not really effective, A. But B, it's not how the Native Americans knew how to fight war. They had a way of war that we can think of today as guerrilla warfare, and it was frankly very effective because it allowed the Native Americans to use the terrain to their advantage. And if you remember, it's the French that are allied with the Native Americans mostly. And when Montcalm comes over, he tries to convince all of them to stand in line and get in formation and shoot at the other guy. And what Montcalm does is he alienates his, his Native American allies. Almost universally, the Native Americans are like, this is stupid. We don't want to die for you, Montcalm. And what they realize is that perhaps if they backed the other guy, they might get better situations. They might get a better shot at winning the war, getting reparations, perhaps getting some of their land back, as was another thing we talked about. And so a guy who recognized this is James Wolfe. And James Wolfe is the British commander, and he's a young guy. Look at him. I mean, he looks like he can't be more than 18. I believe he was actually 20 when the Seven Years' War starts. But he's willing to kind of adapt and use these new ideas that the Native Americans are, are doing. He's willing to... He, now, he doesn't make all of his British troops go off and fight out of the forest and... and use guerrilla tactics, but he's willing to let the Native Americans do that. He's willing to give them a little more autonomy, and what this does is this allows the Native Americans to kind of switch their allegiance. Now that's a bit broad of a paint to kind of, you know, a broad brush stroke to do this in, but in general you can think of it this way. Montcalm, for, for all of his smarts in battle in Europe, he alienates his biggest advantage, and that's the Native American allies. And without that, the French effort in the New World is almost completely lost. There's no way they can win without the, the, the Native American allies, because if you remember, the French population was so small, because they don't need a lot of French people there, so they didn't have a lot of French people there in the first place. And so, through a series of victories and a series of battles, and you know, we're not going to go into each one in detail, there's a general theme that develops and what happens is the British through a combination of their Native American allies which they get because Montcalm pisses them off and also because of the fact that they're using colonial troops remember that was one of our I think that was our fourth thing that we talked about with William Pitt they're using colonial troops so they've got a larger army on the ground in America and they end up winning the battle in America it takes a long time and it's a very bloody fight but I wanted to show you this painting because it's actually a very interesting painting. It's a famous painting, but it gives us an idea of the kind of things that are going through a European mindset, particularly when they're thinking about their colonies in America and, as we'll see later, India. So look at this picture. This is actually depicting the death of our general, the British general, James Wolfe. He's laying died here, and you can see around him he's got all of his British advisors and you can also see there's part people from the colonial militias and they look so concerned about him and also notice how they have these Native Americans here 
this is important because it represents that length that we were talking about that the British start to make with the natives. But I want to suggest to you that this is a very romantic view of, of victory almost or victory or death or of warfare that fits into the European psyche. It fits into what they want war to be. It fits into their ideas of what war should be about. It's about glory. It's about power. It's about fighting for honor and things like that. And a good example of this is how Wolf dies. Now, Wolf dies in one of these battles, in one of the, actually the, the climactic battle of the Seven Years' War. But some of, our, it, some of our sources say that it seems like Wolf was kind of jumping in front of bullets, almost like he wanted to die, which is really weird, right? We don't think of soldiers wanting to kill themselves on the battlefield. They want to get home, they want to go, and they want to go back to their wives or kids or whatever. But Wolf seems to jump in front of bullets he seems to try to get himself killed in this battle. And the reason for that is that he actually has what we would know as today is Crohn's disease, which is the stuff that, you know, if you eat gluten, it gives you really bad bowel problems. But he was essentially slowly dying of a severe form of Crohn's disease. So he's dying of gastrointestinal problems. And he knew that he was going to die soon. And so for, for Wolf, he would rather die in battle than to die sick in a hospital bed. And that's really quite telling. That really tells us a lot about the European view of war. It's not glorious to die in a hospital bed. It's not glorious to die that way. They want to have a story, almost. They want to have a, a, a mythos about them, if you will. And for Wolf, and for many generals, dying in battle or having you know sacrifices you have to give in battle, that was one way to do it. So I tell you that to kind of give you a sense of both what the Europeans were doing, but also how it differs from what the Native Americans were doing. Now, we mentioned before that this conflict is sometimes called the Seven Years' War, and it's also sometimes called the French and Indian War. Now, in the, Europe, in the American context, we typically call it the, the French and Indian War, and the reason for that is the French and Indian War only refers to the American theater. It only refers to the fighting that's going on in America, the stuff that's going on between Montcalm, Wolfe, and the Native American allies and the colonials in America. But the conflict's actually much larger than that. It's actually far much larger than that, and it's actually one of our first world wars. It's not the world wars, so, so to speak, but it is, it is fully a world war in the sense that it involves most continents, and it involves colonial control in all of these continents, and this is truly one of the first large battles for empire. It's a question of who's going to control these things, who's going to get the power, who's going to be the one to call the shots. Now. The British end up fighting, their main, bat, their main enemies are the French, but through a couple of other diplomatic kind of faux pas, they end up fighting the Spanish and sometimes the Dutch. But part of the big place they're fighting, and you can you know, forget about the Dutch and stuff, you just think about them as the French versus the British. Their big, big issue was India. India was seen as the crown jewel of empire. Now, I think I mentioned this in our course, but I think it bears repeating, is that the British, yes, the American colonies are important. Yes, there's a lot of people there. Yes, they're getting tobacco, and they're eventually going to start growing cotton there. But they're mostly interested in what's going on in India. India, remember, when Columbus sails, he's looking for India. When when, and you know, they're still always looking for faster ways to get there. Everything they wanted, all of the goods, all of the, and we'll talk about that a lot in depth in our next lecture, all the things that you want are in India. And so the control of India is a really big issue. And we, I've got, we've got a whole lecture is going to be on that in a minute. Just as we finish up here, what you should know is that one of the battles in the Seven Years' War is crucial absolutely critical in deciding who gets to end up controlling the Indian subcontinent. And that's the Battle of Plassey. And it's in 1757. It's right in the, towards the end of the Seven Years' War. But the Battle of Plassey is important because it's British forces fighting against the French in India. They're fighting in modern-day Bengal. But what's interesting about this battle is that it's not just British and French people. You can see a picture of it here. You see Indians sort of riding on elephants, and there seems to be Indians in the, in, the, in the army. And what's interesting is the British aren't using just British soldiers. They're employing what are called sepoys, and we've got a whole slide on this, we'll get to it. But basically sepoys are Indian nationals that are recruited into the British army. 
So the idea was that the French were there and the British come and they go to the natives that are being sort of subdued by the French and they say, hey, look, you work with us, we'll help you kick the French out. We'll stick it to those dumb Frenchies. We'll stick it to the frogs. We'll be able to kick them out. We'll be able to get them out of here. You just work with us. We'll give you guns. We'll let you work with us and everything will be great. And that's what they did. That's how they win the Battle of Plassey. But I hope you can see where this is going. What ends up happening is they don't give them the, you know, they don't give them the independence that they want. They don't free them from European colonialism. They just replace themselves as the leaders. So they say they kick out the French, but now we're in charge. So the Battle of Plassey is important because it cements British control in India. And we'll talk about that in depth in, a, in another slide. But also, it's not just related to India. It's also, there's wars in Africa. France has a lot of holdings in the West, part of Africa, part of West Africa today that has a lot of Ebola problems. But there's a lot of French presence there. There's a lot of stuff going on there. And they fight a lot of different battles there. So I show you this. So it's not just America. It's not just those things that are going on there. Now, I'll make this a little bigger so you can actually see what's going on here. But so what are some results of the war? Like I mentioned, Great Britain wins. Great Britain wins the Seven Years' War. And what they do after they win the Seven Years' War is actually really remarkable. And, and the ways that it shifts the balance of power in the world is really dramatic. So if you take a look at this picture, it shows us the sort of battlegrounds, the key battle places of the Seven Years' War. Now, of course, there's the American perspective that we talked about earlier, but like I mentioned, there's also fighting in parts of St. Domingue, parts of the Caribbean, and then India is also really important. So it's not, again, it's not just a local conflict. But one of the big results, perhaps the most important result of this, is the French economy is now in awful, awful states, because the French spent so much money trying to win this war because it was so important to them because their col their colonial possessions in America brought them tons of money remember we talked about the fur trade and how valuable that was but also they were interested in maintaining their control in the Caribbean they didn't want Britain to have a lot of control here now they do end up actually ending up keeping St. Domingue which is one which is modern day Haiti and their most wealthy colony and we'll actually talk about that when we get to the French Revolution they keep that until it gains its independence later but what you should know is that France goes into crippling debt. It's, it's really awful. They have a, you know, it really just ruins their economy. And they, they don't have anything to show for it because they lost. They lose much of their possessions in the New World, particularly parts of what are today Canada and Western United States. But what's interesting also is that Prussia, remember how we talked about Frederick the Great briefly. Frederick the Great is fighting France in Europe. And so when Britain wins, one of the things they do is they say, we're going to give some kickbacks to our boy Frederick, our boy the Prussians. And now the Prussians start to, and I've got a picture back a few slides, but part of what Prussia starts to do is they start to get a little bit more confident. They start to get a little more confident. They start to get more territory. They start to fight a little bit more. But what's interesting is this is the start of German nationalism. And the Germans start, and the Prussians will become what we think of today as the Germans. And often they'll look back to Frederick the Great. They'll see him as sort of this paragon, this example of strong German identity. And so this Seven Years' War has impacts that we still will feel well into World War II. But another really important thing is Great Britain passes what's called the Proclamation of 1763. And the Proclamation of 1763 basically says that the British colonists, because remember, they're not Americans yet, but the British colonists can't go west of the Mississippi, or it's not the Mississippi, sorry, west of the Appalachian Mountains. The idea was that, yes, we want all this territory, but one of the things they were doing, one of the conditions of their victory was they had to promise the Native Americans that they could keep their land. So the idea was that, you know, to flip their allegiance from France to England, they said, look, if you fight against the French, we'll kick them off and we'll give you back your, your land. And so Britain's trying to honor that agreement, but also there's another reason they want their settlers to stay there. Part of the worry thing is that it's a lot easier to control them when they're closer to the coast. If all of your people start to move inland, it takes a really long time to get there, to see what they're doing, and it's a lot harder to control. So the British are basically telling the Americans, well, they're not Americans yet, they're still colonists at this point, they're telling the colonists, look, you can't move past the Appalachian Mountains. Now, why is that a problem? What's the problem with saying that to the colonists? Well, 
the colonists believe that's why they started the war in the first place. Because remember, when Washington goes out, he's trying to fight. And look, you can see on this map where Braddock's defeated. It's right around the place that Washington ends up having his big faux pas. They want this area to the west. That's what they want. They want more elbow room. And so the colonists are like, well, what the crap did we die for? Why did we fight this long war, the Seven Years' War, if you're not going to let us go forward, if we're not going to be able to expand into this territory anyways? Now, this is going to be really important for the American Revolution, and we'll get there when we talk about revolutions. But just know for now that the British start to try to do, the, they, they pass the proclamation in order to keep control of the colonists and to appease the natives. But this is really an important moment. It's important for France because it screws them, frank, frankly, and that's going to flavor a lot of the things that are going to come next for France. But it also is important because it's the dawn of the British Empire. This is one of the things that cements their control as the dominant power in the world, frankly. And this is going to be the start of what they call the sun never sets. They say the sun never sets on the British Empire. And the idea was that they had colonies everywhere because it would never actually set because if, as it passed over, you'd still have other colonies that were British. And this map doesn't reflect what they will eventually control. This is just immediately after the Seven Years' War. They control basically all of what was colonized America, at least up to the Mississippi. They control all of Great Britain, so Scotland and Ireland. They control parts of West Africa, parts of Northern South America, lots of places in the Caribbean. And importantly, they're starting to get their firm foothold in India. And we'll see how that goes in our next lecture. But the British are the only ones that have access to India now. And remember, it's the Battle of Plassey that does this. This cements them. This kicks the French out. The Dutch are no longer a player. The Portuguese are no longer a player. It's the, it's the British that have access to India. Now, they also have undisputed naval power. The French Navy gets decimated now. It's, they, they do eventually rebuild it, but it takes them about a decade to do so. And what this means is the British now can basically make market prices whatever they want. Because they're able to control trade. They're able to say, you get to be here, you don't get to be here. You get to be over there, you can't be over here. They have the ability to control trade across the Atlantic. Because look, look at what they control. It's outrageous. They have so much territory, and they also have the biggest fleet in the Atlantic. But even Britain has a problem. One of their problems is, how do you pay for the wars? Because even though Britain wins, they still go into an incredible amount of debt. Because remember, William Pitt's idea was that you have to go into a huge debt in order to win the war. He was right. They wouldn't have won the war without that deficit spending, and also because Montcalm was an idiot and tried to alienate the Native Americans. But the fact that they're in a huge hole now is a big problem. There's a lot of debates going on in the British Parliament about what do we do? We're broke now. How are we going to make back our investment? Now, if you're versed in American history, you already know the part of that answer. They make the colonists pay. They say, look, Washington got us into this mess. The colonists is what we mainly were fighting for. Frequently, they try to ignore the fact that they also get exclusive access to India. So they say, look, we were doing all of these things for you. We're trying to help you out. And so you have to foot the bill. And so what happens is the British go into a huge debt, and their solution is to have the colonists pay it off. And that's going to be one of the things that's going to lead to the American Revolution. And we'll get to all of that. Okay. So that's sort of the, the rest of our lecture for the French and Indian Wars, or the Seven Years' War, however you want to think about it. But we're going to shift gears, and so we're going to continue to look at the British Empire. But we're going to focus on what they consider to be their pride jewels, their, their sort of their, the, the crown in their, the, the, excuse me, the jewel in their crown, the feather in their cap, if you will. And that's India and China. India and China are so vitally important to Great Britain, and we're going to see how. And it, it'll have, a lot of it has to do with the mercantilism ideas we talked about, the ideas of exclusive trading access. And what the British will do, as we'll see, is they'll get raw materials from India, ship them back to Great Britain, make them into goods, and then sell them back to the Indians. And we'll see, we'll see all of that in the lecture. But so our main questions are, explain the stages of British control in India, what allowed them to take over, what did they use India for, and how do they justify the colonization of the country? So basically, what's the pattern that's going on here? Well, it'll be very clear once we get in. But the next question is about China. What do they do in China? How is it related to what they're doing in India? And I really want you to focus, if you perhaps get this on an essay, 
really focus on that second question. How is it related to what's going on in India? Because there's a very direct link between what the British are doing in India and what they're going to do in China. And so really pay attention to that. So what major wars happen between the two powers? And that's between Britain and China. And then what are the results of these wars? And we'll see that in our lecture today. So before we get to the British in, Ch in India, I think it would be a disservice to not talk about these guys. And these guys are the Mughals. And the Mughals are themselves a powerful empire. They believe themselves to be kind of the descendants of Genghis Khan. Now, somebody actually in one of my classes had a really good question. Why don't the, the, the Mongols end up conquering all of India, right? They conquer all of the Middle East. They conquer all of Europe. But they don't really seem to go into India. Well, that's because they don't eventually, they don't start by going into India because that wasn't their focus. But what we'll see here is another group of nomadic steppe people who are going to be called the Timurids, but you don't need to remember that, sort of conjoin around this great leader called Babur. And Babur is the founder of the Mughal Empire. But remember, he's a conqueror. He's not a peaceful guy, and he's not Indian. So those are two important things. There's a conquest dynasty, and it's an Indian, it's a non-Indian dynasty. But he's actually distantly related to Genghis Khan. So in a weird way, Genghis Khan eventually finishes the conquest of India many, 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 many years later. But the key here, conquest dynasty one, and also that it's a non-Indian culture. Notice how he's a Muslim. This is when Islam really starts to take deep roots in India. This is going to be the sort of the, the foundation of a lot of the really strong religious problems that India and Pakistan are going on through today. Because notice, this is a map of the Mughal Empire. This covers all of today's India, except for the bottom part, what's today's Sri Lanka. But it covers all of India, all of what's going to be uh, parts of Bangladesh, and also all of Pakistan. And all of this was controlled under this large Mughal Empire. And I, well, it's kind of, you can think of it as a mixing pot. And sort of in the same way that America's a mixing pot. It's got all kinds of different nationalities. It's got all kinds of different ethnicities. And that's true for the Mughal Empire as well. But I, there's something I really want to reinforce. And a story that's often repeated is that the Mughals were the ones who started religious violence in India. And that is true to some extent. There are some isolated examples of Mughals or some nomadic people going into India, going into Hindu shrines, which was the dominant religion, Hindu and Buddhism. And actually Jainism is important, but we're not going to focus on Jainism. But also, they're going to these shrines, and so there's these stories of these, these conquerors coming in and they'll burn all down these, these Hindu shrines. Now, that probably happened in isolated incidents. But think about why that's probably not true. If you're trying to rule a giant country, and you're trying to get a lot of money out of them, it's not very effective to go in and burn down their, their most sacred shrines. In fact, a lot of the new evidence that we're finding suggests that the Mughal Empire was actually pretty religiously tolerant. There was not a difficulty for them to have Hindu people in government, to have Buddhist people in government, and have those two groups working alongside the Muslims. And so one of the reasons we have these stories is because that's what the British suggest. And we'll get to that. But the idea is that the British sort of create the idea that the Mughals are keeping you down. The reason that you, you Hindus aren't ruling your own countries is the Mughals have been dominating you for centuries. And they're giving you all of these terrible things. And they're these terrible conquerors. And they're doing these awful things to you. But in reality, it was a very religiously tolerant and kind of ethnically tolerant place. But also really focus here, it is very prosperous. This place is really wealthy. It's the Mughal Empire that's thriving when people are looking for India. They have trade routes that connect them both by land and to sea to Europe. They're making a killing. There's so much money that's ma being made here. They have incredible works of architecture. You can see all kinds of examples of this. You can see they have these beautiful red Mughal brick forts that are just beautiful. But you can also look at stuff like the Taj Mahal is built during this period. But also there's a flourishing of science, like many other Muslim dynasties. And that's going to be an important thing that we've already seen. But we'll talk about that specifically when we get to Islam. But this, so this was a prosperous society. And so for a long time, really from the, the late 1300s, all well into the 1700s, the Mughal Empire is doing really well.
But it eventually starts to break apart. And this happens with many empires. And part of the reason it breaks apart is because it is so diverse. So the people over here, what do they have in common with the people in the far northwest? Not a lot, really. They probably eat different food. They probably have different religious beliefs. They probably don't speak the same language. And so a problem with the Mughals is just the sheer geographic size of the empire. So what happens is individual kings or counts or barons will kind of say, well, you know, if I'm way over here in Bengal and the emperor is way over here, who's going to stop me from kind of getting a little bit more power and sort of bringing my own army in? And so what happens is the Mughal Empire kind of fractures in the 1700s. It kind of starts to break apart. It still exists, but it doesn't exist in this all-encompassing sort of map painting quality that we see here. It's a much more broken up piece of empire. And we can see that here. Now, we'll get about to the British East India Company in a second, but I want to look, I want you to have to look at this map right here, this one in the middle. Now, you can't see it very clearly, and that's because it's sort of an older map, but it gives us an idea of how complicated this situation is. You have all kinds of different states and different duchies and different kingdoms that believe they should be the rightful heir, and they're all fighting amongst each other. They all want to be either the new Mughal emperor, so they want to be the ones to call the shots in the Mughals, or they want to kick the Mughals out entirely and form something entirely different. And keep that in mind when we talk about the British. Now, the British East India Company is a company that we've already briefly mentioned, but it's going to become very important in our story. And they're, also, they're what's called a joint stock company. And we've already talked about a joint stock company. The first joint stock company that we've talked about, if you remember, was the Jamestown Colony. And the idea of the joint stock company was that everybody puts in a little bit of money so that there's less risk. And that basically allows you to divide the risk among people and allows you to really be able to engage in a lot better business practices because you don't have as much individual risk and so you can do riskier stuff as a group. And so the British East Company is founded as that. It's founded as a, as a joint stock company but what's fascinating about the British East India Company is because of how much money was put into it, both by the British government, because the British government wants to encourage trade, remember? They see the Portuguese and the Dutch starting to explore, and they start to see them trying to get footholds in India and in Africa, and they don't want that. So they put money into this East India Company, but also private, private investors. They have a vested interest in making sure this company succeeds. So they put a lot of money in to make sure that things are going really well. And so what happens is it becomes incredibly wealthy. They have more ships than any. They have more ships. This, again, this is not the British government. The British East India Company is not the British government. They're a company. But they have more ships and more soldiers than many countries do. That's outrageous. They're so wealthy. They're so autonomous. They're able to act almost like an independent state. So kind of think of them that way. But what's fascinating about the British East India Company, and I've sometimes abbreviated it as EIC, so if you see me write EIC, that's the East India Company, but it accounts for half of world trade in the 1700s. That's outrageous. That's remarkable. They have, they have their hands in everybody's pie. They've got all sorts of different ventures and, and sort of business enterprises all across the world. They're so interested in keeping control of this, in fact, that that's one of the things that leads them to start taking control of India. But I want to really also mention how pervasive this is. When Boston Harbor is the site of the Boston Tea Harbor, or the Boston Tea Party, well, excuse me, of course Boston is the site of the Boston Harbor. When Boston is the place of the Tea Party, the tea that they're dumping into the, 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 the ocean is from the East India Company. And you might say, oh, well, that doesn't matter. They are the ones who get exclusive trading rights in America. When we get to the Tea Acts, which we'll talk about a lot when we get to revolution, particularly the American Revolution, is the East India Company is given a monopoly. The East Co India Company has so much money that they're actually able to make independent negotiations with other separate states. That's outrageous. They have so much money. It's, it's really remarkable. And so I, wanted, I show you this to give you a conception of how pervasive it is. They've got large, you can see this picture over here of this large scale, this large scale building and architecture work that they've got done in London. It's this kind of big building and you go there and you, that's the base, the headquarters of the East India Company. It's right there in the middle of London. But what do they do in India? 
Now that's really the point of our story today. Is how, what are they doing in India? Now what they're doing in India is they're arriving at the time that the Mughal Empire is sort of falling apart, sort of breaking into these different kingdoms that we just talked about. And what they recognize is each individual state wants to get an advantage over its enemies, over its neighbors. So they say, hey, look, you know, if you're if you're in this, you know, let's say you're on this little stretch in what's called Arissa, and let's say you're trying to compete with your neighbors to the north. You well, you want to get ahead, right? Well, the East India Company will come in and say, well, hey, do us a favor. Let us set up a warehouse in your country. Let's set up a warehouse in your kingdom that we can use as sort of a dock, right? As sort of a shipping place. You bring your stuff to the warehouse and then we'll sell it for you. We'll give you a 25% cut of everything we sell. If you're trying to get an edge over your rivals, you don't care about the potential long-term effects of allowing the Europeans to get a foothold. You're like, yeah, hell yeah, I'm going to let you do it because you're going to bring me money. So that's how they get their first foothold into the Indian subcontinent. They say, look, work with individual kingdoms, dukes, lords, and say, help me out here. And a lot of them do it. A lot of them are willing to do it. Now, what happens with these warehouses is really fascinating. These warehouses start kind of small. They kind of, you can think of them as little buildings. They're kind of open air market kind of things, but they eventually get bigger into what we would think of as today as a proper warehouse of basically storing goods before a ship would come and be able to take it back to England or where it was going. But what's fascinating about these warehouses is as they were bringing more and more money to their individual lords, the lords gave them more and more favors, and they eventually turn, turn them into what are eventually just going to be forts, military operations. And they'll basically have walls around them, and they'll have British troops, British East India Company troops, by the way, patrolling them that are protecting their interests. And the reason they do this is because they're making so much money. There's so much money being made on all sides. The kings and lords think they're getting a good deal. They think that they're doing something that's beneficial to them and doesn't going to have a long-term impact. They're wrong. Because what's going to happen is the East India Company is going to use these footholds and this sort of unstable climate in India to their advantage. And that's going to be the thing that propels them forward. And we'll see that in our next slide. And so, like I say here, the reason they're able to prosper is both from individual warlords or kingdoms giving them patronage, but also the Mughal dynasty is falling apart. The Mughals are falling apart and they're having a lot of problems. So this is all sort of going on in the early 1700s and then the Battle of Plassey happens. And you know we talked about the Battle of Plassey in our last lecture and it's important. It's really important. The Battle of Plassey is very important and that's why we've got a whole other slide on it. It's not just one lecture, it's two. Two for one, all right. So Battle of Plassey. It happens and what this does is it not only kicks out the French kicks out the Dutch and the Portuguese because it allows these kingdoms and states to have faith in the British East India Company. They say, look, you know, we don't want to be involved. We have enough problems at home. We don't need to be involved in what's going on with these Portuguese and Dutch. We're just going to essentially back the British East India Company. And notice where it starts. The Battle of Plassey happens right here, right around here. And today was part of Bengal or, or Bangladesh. And it starts there. In 1780, it starts there. But what happens is they get their control here and look how quickly they expand their power. By the 1850s, essentially 70 years later, they control either directly or indirectly, and we'll talk about the difference between the two, almost all of India. That's remarkable. I'll remind you, this is like a, this is a company. This is not a country. This is a company. It's almost like Walmart having soldiers and then they'd conquer like South Africa and just sort of set up shop there. That's essentially what's happening. Super wealthy company and using that wealth, that wealth and power to their advantage. So what's interesting here, and we talked about this, is East India Company is not just sending a bunch of British people to die. They're not sending people to go fight these, these other kingdoms. What they're doing is they're hiring Indian soldiers. And remember, it's all about money. They're making so much money. They're getting so wealthy. They're able to essentially hire people to fight for them. Now, why would the Indians fight for them? Why would they hire Indians to fight other Indians? Why would they agree to do that? Part of the reason is money. And, you know, we keep talking about that. People will do a lot for money. So part of it's people being mercenaries. But the other part is what we mentioned before. The Mughal dynasty is breaking apart, and everybody thinks that they should be the ones to call the shots. So what happens is when they kind of settle down and 
in Bengal, they start taking the people here and they say, well, hey, look, we can help expand your influence. Notice the language here. They're not saying expand our power. They say, look, we want to help you. We want to help you, Mr. King of Bengal. We want to help you get more power. So why don't you send your troops over here and we'll supply you. And what ends up happening is, as you can see, they start to push west and they also start to push down to the south. But that's all through a few British soldiers, but mostly Indian soldiers. They're buying Indian soldiers to fight for this. Now, I also want to focus on this yellow part here. And I don't know if you can see this, but the stuff in purple is direct rule. This is essentially you can think of as a East India Company governor sitting there and telling them what to do. So they have a direct control of the territory. They would essentially be the new lords of the of the country. And this is pretty substantial, right? Because look how much purple's on this map. It's a pretty big deal. Now, people weren't terribly happy about that, as I'm sure you could imagine, right? You know, you have you know Europeans coming in and they're making all this money and you're not getting it if you're a rival state, so that sucks. So it starts a lot of problems. And what ends up happening is they're not able to fight and conquer all of India. And so what they instead do is they use political maneuvering. So they say, oh, your brother's half-brother might be related to the crown. Well, we'll kill him and give you a, a sure shot to the throne as long as you give us money and taxes. Or we'll give you protection with our army, Mr. King, that's in yellow over here in the middle part of India, so long as you don't attack us. And they're like, sure, we don't want any trouble. We'll, we'll be autonomous and we won't have to worry about it. And so that's how it worked. The East India Company is making deals. They're cutting deals with people. They're cutting, essentially, they're acting as a negotiator between these different states, but all to the British advantage. They're essentially trying to play one of them off each other. Now, what does this sound like? What does this sound similar to? This sounds a lot similar to what the British do in Africa, right? When the British are in Africa, they start to play each other, play African cultures off one another. They say, "Hey, look, you know, your your neighbors to the west, well, they want to give us, you know, soldiers and troops, but they're willing to give us X amount of money. Will you give us Y amount of money?" The same thing's happening here. Now, what's interesting about this is after the Battle of Plassey and the East India Company starts to get control here, they start to be really interested in India. Yeah, they're interested in before, but it used to just be about trading and tax. Now they're interested in administration. And the reason for this is they're really interested in keeping what they've just conquered. And again, I'll remind you, this is a company, not a country. And so often people say, and I, I admit it, I do it as well, that Britain conquered India. It's not technically correct. The British East Company conquers India. But what's fascinating is they don't just rest on their laurels. They, as you can see, they keep expanding their territory. They keep going around and conquering the rest of either indirectly or directly. But now they're interested in administration. They're interested in how are we going to keep this our own? How are we going to keep this going forward? And the way that they decide to do this is very authoritative. The East India Company very quickly becomes a very bad thing for the Indians. They essentially force the Indians to, to do agriculture. They try to give them nominal titles. They say, oh, look, you can have this you know, land title or you can have this honorary title if you do our work. But it didn't really mean anything. They're doing the same things they do in North America. They're essentially removing the social structure and putting them in at the top. Now. We're going to talk about cottons, tea, and opiates extensively in, the, in a few of our other slides, but I want to talk about how this is working with the East India Company. The East India Company using that concept of mercantilism. Now remember, mercantilism is the idea that colonies, or in this case India, exist solely to make the mother country or company rich. And that's what they wanted to do. So they make basically that if you want to if you want to buy or sell cottons, tea, and opiates, which are the three big ones for India, you have to do it through the East India Company. Well, what does that mean? That means fixed prices. That means the East India Company gets even richer, but your poor Joe Schmo farmer isn't seeing any of that. And so what happens is there's an incredible amount of wealth that's generated in India, but almost none of that goes to the natives. So the natives are essentially being kept down, and we'll see numerous examples of that in the next slide and the one after that. But it also makes them very poor and that's going to be a big problem. And it comes to a head. It comes to a big point. And it comes to a point that's called the Sepoy Mutiny. And 
I don't really think that the Sepoy, calling it the Sepoy Mutiny does it a lot of justice, because calling something a mutiny is kind of giving it a bad name. It's kind of saying that, oh, these people were mutinous. They're, you know, a kind of a cancerous thing that we need to get rid of. And that really misses the point. And I much prefer the way the Indians call it. The Indians call this the first war of independence. And I think that much better reflects the attitude and the feelings involved. And this comes to a head after about 100 years of British East India Company rule. Now remember that, that's East India Company, not British. The, Brit the British government will come in after this, but up until this point, it's all company business. Now, what's going on to make them so upset? So Sepoys are the ones who, are, who essentially revolt. These are the soldiers. These are trained soldiers. But notice here, they're local. These are Indian soldiers. We talked about these. These are what the British use in the Battle of Plassey. Well, they continue to use these for 100 years. Why do you think that is? Why do you think they keep using these? The reason it's a lot easier than bringing over and letting your own white people die. That's part of the reason why. For the, for the British East India Company, it was a lot easier for them to convince the Indians to come over and die for them than it was to convince the British to come over and die. And so what they would do is they would pay the Sepoys, and the Sepoys were a large part of the British East India Company army. So much so that we sometimes think that their army, and remember, this is crazy, we're talking about a company's army. The company's army was 500,000 people. Well, 450,000 of those troops were Sepoys. They were Indians. Now, I want you to think about the problem with this. It seems pretty apparent when you think about it in hindsight. Hindsight's 2020, right? But what's the problem if you're keeping a people down, right? On the one hand, you're, you're abusing them. You're, it, we'll, t we'll talk about the abuse in a second, but you're abusing them. You're taking all their money. You're essentially making them do everything you want them to do. What's the problem with taking that same group of people and giving them guns and weapon training? I hope you can see the problem. The problem is that they're arming the people who are going to end up trying to overthrow them. And what's the catalyst? There's always, in, in revolutions and independence, there's always usually one or two catalysts. In the American Revolution, it's the, the tea and the stamp acts and all that stuff. And the French Revolution, we'll see that later, but it's, it's uh, the, there's a series of acts that are problems. But in the Sempoy case, there's a, a lot of underlying long-term issues. And part of the issue is the castes. Now, castes have been a thing in India for a long time. The caste system is a basically a hierarchy. You have four castes, with the bottom being the untouchables, and on the top you have the, the religious leaders, and in the middle you've got the elites. But what's interesting about the caste system is it's very rigid. Many other countries have sort of like an unspoken rule. Remember when we talked about New Spain and their caste system, quote unquote? It's not written down. It's not codified into law. It's not written in their religious works. In the Indian context, it is in all of their old texts. It's written in the Upanishads. It's written in the Rig Veda. It's in their most fundamental text, and it's something part of their culture for the last 2,000 years. Now, what the British were doing is they were indiscriminately having different castes serve together in the army. Because from the British East India Company's perspective, a soldier is a soldier. They don't care. They don't have a conception of a caste system. They don't, they don't care if, if Bob over here is a different caste than another guy over here. Well, it was very shameful if you were a member of the second class to fight with a member of the fourth class or even of the third and the, thir uh, and the second. So the class, uh, the caste mixing was a big problem in the army. It was a sort of a, a, a front to traditional values. They felt like their values were being contested. Now, I really want to reemphasize that. We can look at the caste system today and say, look how authoritative it is and how bad it is, particularly if you're an untouchable class. And that's probably true, and it's, pro it's still true today. But it's still part of their tradition. And for them, it's not authoritative. And for many of them, it was something that was very important to them. And another issue is missionaries. Along with the East India Company, once the East India Company gets control, a lot of missionaries in in Europe are recognizing, hey, well now we have a foothold, now we've got a place where people are speaking English that we can go and we can get a free pass for missionizing. And a lot of missionaries end up coming over. A lot of missionaries come over and a lot of people in India are upset about this. And the reason they're upset about this is because not only do they feel like their traditional culture is being threatened, but now their religion is being threatened. 
So these missionaries are coming in and they're quite forceful. They're, many, some of them are. Some of them are quite forceful and they're trying to convert these people to Protestantism. And there's rumors that starts. Now remember, most of the army is sepoys. Most of the armies are local soldiers. And so some of them start these rumors that these missionaries are coming in and they've got these heathen worship practices that are trying to, you know, eat Indian babies and do all this stuff. And, you know, a lot of that's nonsense. But what's interesting is that spreads the idea. It gets the idea in people's minds rolling that, look, there's these problems with the Europeans. But the big catalyst, the big reason that this sepoy mutiny or this first war of independence sparks is this issue. And I've got to underline because it's the most important. It's the issue of cartridges. It seems so weird. Now, you're looking at the guns that they used to use. This is the gun that the set boys use. It's called an Enfield. I can't remember. It's like an 1854 Enfield or something like that. But what's interesting about this gun is it's got a cartridge. And so cartridges are a really cool thing because you don't have to sort of flip the gun over and then you know push it down and pour black gunpowder in and make it really slow. It's a lot more efficient. So cartridges, the cartridge system is basically a little thing that has the bullet and a bunch of gunpowder and you put it in and then you're good to go. You can shoot from there. You know, it's obviously not as effective, effective as like a magazine or a clip, but it's a much, it's a new advancement. It's a great new thing. So the British East India Company brings this over, and they're like, yeah, this is great. People are going to love this. We're going to be you know, more effective, or our army is going to be better. But there's a problem. The cartridge is in a little paper package, and it's pre-greased so that it fires out of the rifle really easily. So you know, that's really great, right? So you don't have to worry about greasing it. And it's in its paper package so that you don't have to get the grease all over your hands. It seems like a really good solution. Well, the way that you would use this is you'd actually have to bite the paper off of the, the the cartridge before you put it in. Now, why am I telling you all this? What does this have to do with anything? There's rumors that start to spread, and some of the rumors are true, that what they're using, and uh, they're using different manufacturers for these cartridges, but some of the cartridges use taro or beef taro to grease them, and some of them are using pig fat to grease them. Now, what would be the big problem with using beef fat that comes from cows and pig fat that comes from pigs in a country that's entirely populated with Hindus and Muslims. This is a big problem. For the Hindus, the cow is a sacred animal. And now, if they want to serve in the army, the British government is telling, or excuse me, not the British government, the British East India Company is telling them, you have to put beef fat in your mouth. That is a huge no-no in the Hindu religion. And so they see this as a huge affront, and they start complaining. The Muslims at first are like, yeah, well, you know, you, you, that's what you get for being Hindu. But then there start to be the rumors of there being pig fat. Well, you're not supposed to eat pig. You're not supposed to eat, it's, it's, a, it's an unclean animal in Islam. So both groups of people, the British East India Company, unbeknownst to them, because they're not, you know, they're not, the East India Company is not Hindu, they're not Muslim. So they're not aware of these underlying issues. And what they inadvertently do is cause a mass panic, a mass riot. And these, these sepoys, they essentially gather together and they turn their guns on their captives. They turn the guns on the British. And at first it's very successful because, like I mentioned, they outnumber them by a huge amount. They outnumber them by a crazy huge amount. And so they, they start to win these battles. But the British government says, no, we're not going to risk losing this. It still has 100 years to do this. You know, we even poured money into the East India Company, but it is so lucrative for us. We cannot afford to lose it. We cannot afford to lose India. It just is impossible. If we lose India, everything will fall. And that is the start of the British Raj. And that happens the year after the first war of Indian independence. And Raj basically means empire, but it refers to India. The British Empire in India is the British Raj. And this is the point when it becomes directly controlled by the crown. The British crown comes in, and Queen Victoria is now the new queen of India. And so they basically, again, like I said, they make the argument that it's too valuable to lose. They can't lose this territory. If they lose this, it ruins their colonial enterprise. But the British do a lot of stuff when they're here. They build railroads. We'll talk about this when we get the Industrial Revolution. But they build universities. They build infrastructure. They build canals all over the country. They greatly improve the quality of their roads. They greatly improve their medical care in their eyes. They do a lot of things that what they tell to the British public are all positive things. 
one of the other things they do is they start to tell the British public, look, we're getting rid of all these old, terrible customs. One of the customs was if a, if a woman was widowed, was for her to throw herself on the funeral pyre of her, of her dead husband. And they said, look, this is barbaric. We stopped them doing this. But from the Indian perspective, that was something that was very important to their culture. Yes, it seems barbaric to our eyes. But for the Indians' experience of the British coming in, it was a profound attack on their way of life. But I want you to really notice this, because we're going to really start to see this in this course. The British claim to be doing this for their own good. They go in and they're basically saying, look, these people don't deserve to have their own country. They deserve to be under our control. We're going to help them. They saw these things as helping them, ignoring the mass poverty that they're putting these people through, ignoring the agricultural famines that they're putting through. They're seeing these things as positive influences, when in reality, they're crippling India, truly crippling India. So what else do they do? Well, there's lots of stuff. You can have a whole course on just the British Raj, but some of the important things for our course are what they do to the British, or excuse me, the Indian agriculture. And this is really important because it used to be that the, the Indians would grow all kinds of crops they would need, right? Because you, if you're a farmer, you're going to grow stuff you need to survive. You're going to grow stuff that allows you to feed your family, but you're also going to grow a couple stuff on the side. Well, the British Raj comes in and says, you know, we are making a lot of money, but we're not making quite enough. So you farmers that are growing, you know, corn, which is, again, a new world crop that causes a big boom in India, but they're growing corn and wheat and apricots or any kind of different foods, you know, stop doing that. Stop growing your food. You should buy it from a British market. You should buy British food that's grown in that's either grown in another British colony that we can control the price on. So again, they're making money on this. But instead of doing that, why don't you grow cotton and opium? Now, what's the problem with growing just cotton and opium? You can't eat cotton and opium. And what happens is it changes the Indian society so that now they're almost completely dependent on, in, uh, on British agriculture. They're completely dependent on British food. This is a big problem. Because what happens when there's a famine and Britain needs more food than usual? Well, they're going to raise the price for the Indians. They're going to basically say, all right, Indians. Sorry, the mailman was outside. We'll get him in the house. The Indians are basically screwed. Because if there's less food available overall, you know, let's say there's a big potato famine that goes on. That's a big thing that happens, isn't it? So let's say there's a big potato famine goes on. Well, you're going to divert all your food to that particular place, for example, in Ireland. That means that India is not going to get their food. Well, they say, oh, the Indians will be fine. They can take care of it on themselves. But they changed all of their farms from food to cash crops. But I really want to reinforce this. This doesn't make Indians rich. The Indians aren't making tons and tons of money off of this. And I want to show you this picture because I think this picture, more than anything else, gives us a representation of the British Raj. Now, look at this. What do you see? This is a British guy laying back in a chair. He's reading a newspaper. So newspapers are important, first of all. But he's got two Indian servants. One of them is essentially fanning him. And the other guy is giving him a, ped uh, giving him a pedicure. This is the British perspective of the Indians. They see them as servants, not better than slaves, frankly. And so they're using these people, and they see the Indians as a way for them to get rich. Many Indians die. This is going to be one of the things that leads to Gandhi and real Indian independence, is the fact that they're being exploited, frankly, awfully, and they're dying of starvation. Now, India is only one part of the Asian perspective for Great Britain. Great Britain is interested in India. Oh, excuse me. They are interested in what's going on in India. And it's bringing them a lot of money. But it's only one part of their trade triangle. The other part of it is China. Now, just like we talked about India's dynasty before we got to British involvement, we need to do the same for China. At this point in time, China is ruled by what's called the Qing dynasty. Now, the Qing dynasty replaced the Ming dynasty, which we talked about last time. That was the dynasty with Zheng He, and they kind of turned inward after a while. But the Qing dynasty conquers the old Ming dynasty. And I really want to reinforce this. This is a conquest dynasty. These are not Chinese people on the throne. These are not Chinese Hans on the top of the throne. These are Manchu. These are Manchurians. They're in the, they come from this region north of Korea. 
But what's fascinating about this, ter with this time period is it's incredibly prosperous. The Qing dynasty is considered to be one of the high marks of Chinese civilization. They make lots of money. They're incredibly prosperous. Their population booms. Oh, man, does it boom. They've got hundreds of millions of people. And that's not, I'm, I didn't misspeak. By this point, they have about 200 million people. Great Britain even doesn't even have 30 million people. They are incredibly far ahead in terms of raw manpower. Now, what's interesting about this is China has always been ahead technologically. Now, if you remember, when we last like, left the Chinese, they had boats that were bigger than anybody else on the planet. But they burned them all and kind of turned inward. But what's fascinating about this is they didn't really need to innovate a lot. Yes, there are innovations in China. It's not a stagnant society. It stagnates a little bit, but it's not completely stagnant. But they don't really need to do the industrial revolution thing. And the reason is there's no impetus. In Great Britain, they have an X amount of land, and we'll talk about this when we get to the Industrial Revolution. They have a, a certain amount of land, and they've got a certain amount of resources they can exploit out of it, and they have to use it because they're a tiny island. China's huge, and it's got tons of people. It's less important for the Chinese to do it. And so while the Europeans in Great Britain is industrializing, China is not, and that's going to be one of our reasons that China ends up getting conquered. So Europeans start to land on these Chinese ports, and they're really interested in China. And they want to go all the way in China. They want to have, they want to set up what they had in India. They want to have sort of, at first, uh, the, the, they want their warehouses, and they want to turn those into forts. And they eventually want to do the same thing they do to India. But they can't do that to China, because China is not breaking up like the Mughals are. They have an incredibly powerful central government. And the central government doesn't want the Europeans there. Yeah, they want them, you know, they're like, if you have to be here, you can be in one or two specific ports. So they tell them, yeah, look, you can be in a couple of ports. You can be down here near Guangzhou. You can be kind of up here, but stay away from Beijing. Stay away from the capital. We don't really want you here. Now, remember, that kind of reflects what we already learned about China. Trade's not something that's really important to the government. Trade is going to become really important now because there's, the floodgates are going to open. And it, not by choice. China does not want the floodgates to open, but it's going to whether or not they like it to. So let's talk a little bit more about trade because it is very important. So China's trade power. So like I said here, it, they officially turn inward. They essentially say, we don't need anything else. Everything we need is in China. We don't need to worry about all these barbarians coming to our borders trying to trade with us. Yeah, that's nice. That's cute. You've got little trinkets and stuff. You know, you've got little clocks that are mechanized and stuff. But everything we need is here. So the government doesn't officially sanction trading. But in the Qing dynasty in particular, individuals start to realize how wealthy they could get because what they find is that the Europeans' appetite for Chinese goods is insatiable. The Chinese have stuff that the British just cannot get anywhere else. And those three things are porcelain, tea, and spices. And actually, this says spices. I'm just going to change it. It's not spices. It's silk. Porcelain, silk, and tea. They did have spices, but they could get those anywhere. It's the Chinese porcelain, and we'll talk about porcelain. Porcelain, the Chinese porcelain was so fine that you could cut people with it. European porcelain was just, you know, kind of, it was, it was kind of backwards. And the reason for this is that the Chinese had been doing it for centuries. And see, Chinese porcelain, they'd, they'd been doing it for centuries, and they, there's like a 20 degree Fahrenheit temperature range that you have to heat it to get it this nice blue glaze on it. But Chinese porcelain is where we get our word China. We all have a China cabinet at home, right? Like if you've got a grandmother, they've got a China cabinet. It's full of fine China. That's the word. That's where we get it from. Porcelain is very important. Now, porcelain has a problem. Porcelain is important, but it's not the biggest export from China because porcelain's really hard to transport on an old rickety boat on a three-month journey across the world. So porcelain's important, but often came back broken. Silk is another really important one. Silk is very important because it's mainly viewed as a luxury item. It's viewed as sort of a luxurious thing that you wear if you're really, really wealthy. And it, yes, they have a huge demand for it. They have, they love silks, and it's a really important, it's a really important business. But silk sort of takes a backseat to cotton because Indian cotton's coming through, and cotton has a lot of advantages. It's really cheap when you industrialize it, and it's also really breathable. It's, it's, it's really easy to clean, and wool and silk don't have that benefit. The biggest crop is tea. 
they can't really get tea anywhere else. China makes more tea than anybody else. And by the 1800s, the British become addicted to tea. I think I mentioned this story, but the British have tea time today, right? Where they kind of take a break in the middle of their day and they have tea. Well, it hasn't always been tea time in the, Victor the pre-Victorian era. It used to be that they would eventually stop and take whiskey time. They would stop and they would have liquor, hard liquor during their day. So at around two o'clock, everybody would take a 15 minute breather instead of having a smoke. Well, they would actually sometimes go smoke, but then they would go and drink hard liquor. What's the problem with that? Your whole country is getting drunk in the middle of the day. It's not very efficient. They actually had a lot of problems with industrial accidents because people were getting drunk in the factories. So the British government says, all right, we know that drinking is important and we know that it's kind of a social activity. We need to find a replacement. The replacement was tea. And they're like, hey, drink this tea. You can put you can put sugar in it. It'll be sweet. You'll really like it. Drink tea instead of liquor. But what's fascinating is tea really catches on. They get an insatiable appetite for tea. They're, in, they're importing millions of pounds of tea every year. It's an incredible amount of tea. And what ends up happening is at first China's reluctant, but they see how much money is coming in. Individual Chinese businessmen that are willing to work with the Europeans get filthy rich. And other people start to take notice. They're like, hey, this guy's getting rich. I want to be rich too. So they start to take notice. So what happens is other people start to get involved and it becomes a bigger and bigger and bigger business. More trading spots start to pop up all along the coast of China. More people are becoming traders. More people are interested in getting this European silver. And it's silver that's important in this story. It brings in millions and millions of pounds of, chi of European silver. A lot of that comes from Sarah de Potosi. Right? A lot of that comes from the Spanish silver mines that had been circulated in Europe for a long time. So Europe has an overabundance of silver. The Chinese value silver more than they do gold. So the Chinese are like, hell yeah, send us all your silver. That sounds great. We're on board with that. So the Chinese are getting fabulously wealthy and the government starts to take notice. They're like, yeah, this is really cool. So they kind of encourage more you know, trading. But what I really want to get here is this last point. When they are making crazy amounts of money, imagine the perspective from the Chinese. They are having the Europeans fight over each other. They're tripping over each other to trade with China. They're tripping over each other to get away from each other. They're trying to get into China. All of them are doing it. And so China's like, yeah, we're hot stuff. Everybody wants what we've got. This reinforces Chinese ideas that they're the top, that they're the top dog, that they're the ones calling the shots in this relationship. In reality, that's going to change very quickly. And it's going to change with this, opium. Now, I mentioned this in a previous slide, but where are the British getting the opium? They're getting it from India. They're growing poppies in India. That was one of the things they make the Indians grow instead of food. They're like, you make cotton, you make opium. That's what you're good for. That's what's going to make us rich. But there's kind of a, a trade triangle that's going on here. And I want to I detail it because it's really, really important. This is what the British do. This is what makes them so rich. So a British ship, a large British ship, will leave London, London Harbor, and it's essentially going to be full of factory goods. Now, this process is basically that they take Indian and American, at some points, raw materials, and then bring them back to British factories, use those factories, make a, a finished product, and then sell it back to the, to the place they bought it from. Now, in America, it doesn't work very well because America, they can make their own rules. But in their colonies that they, that they still control, they make it illegal to make your own shirts, for example. So they say, look, you can, you're not allowed to spin thread into cloth to make your own cloth. You have to buy British cloth. So that's how they've created a monopoly on that. That's going to be one of the things that causes the Indian revolutions. But so I want to give you that perception. That's what they're doing. That's where they're getting these factory goods from. So they load up their ship full of factory goods. They land in India and they sell all of that to India. Every single thing of that they sell to Indians. But they sell it for opium. They're essentially doing a trade. They're doing a barter system. Sometimes they're doing it for money. But for the most part, this part of the journey is a barter. They give them the necessities they need for life, like the factory goods, like the, the clothing, the, the shoes, the materials that you need that they're not letting the Indians make, and also food. So what this means is the Indians don't have a choice. They don't have a choice not to buy this. They don't have a choice not to engage in this trade. They have to if they want to survive. 
So what China, what the British do is then they fill up their boats with opium. And they take that opium and then they go to China. And they sell it to the Chinese. And they basically take the silver that they just put into the country and they take it right back out and then return rich. They return to China, they return to Great Britain with boatfuls of silver. They make stupid amounts of money. Boatloads of silver and essentially tea. And tea is a great crop because it's really light and it's, it's really pricey per pound. So tea and silver is what they're coming back with. But I really want to reinforce this. Sometimes people say, oh, the British weren't as culpable in this as, as, as history or I'm making them might seem. They, you know, they didn't know they were doing something that was deliberately addictive to people. That's not true. The British knew that this was a drug. They knew that this was dangerous and they knew that it was detrimental to society. The British outlawed opium in their own country well before they start trading it in China. They knew it was a, that it was a terrible thing. They knew that opium was addictive. And that's why so everybody has this image of Queen Victoria, right? She's supposed to be one of the most important British queens, and they've got this very regal view of her, and you know, this, she's always portrayed as really wonderful in history. Well, the Chinese perspective, and I've, I've heard this from some stories with Chinese people I've talked to, is that they call her the world's most prolific drug dealer, and they're probably not wrong, because she, she, she got so much opium into China, we'll see this on our next slide, that it almost addicted uh, I believe the percentage was about 15% of their country. That's outrageous. If 15% of our country was addicted to a, a dangerous subject like that, we would be ground to a halt. It's incredibly, incredibly dangerous. Now, the way that they would smuggle opium is they'd smuggle them in these five pound balls, and you can see it right here. They'd make it in these five pound balls, and then they'd put them on a bunch of ships. They'd put a bunch of those balls in a chest, and then put the chest on a boat, and then send it to China. But what's interesting is the Chinese, they say, no, you're not allowed to sell this opium. They see how awful it is. They see how terrible it is. And they basically say, no, you're not allowed to trade it anymore. But that doesn't stop the British. The British say, no, you're not allowed to tell us what we can and can't trade. If your people want to buy it, it should be allowed. And that's what they start to call free trade. They say, look, you can't regulate this. If you don't want people to buy it, tell them not to buy it. If we find a buyer, that's their fault, not you, not ours. And so that's uh, that's the key. The British start smuggling it into China. They do it illegally. They start to work with backhand deals, and basically they they're telling them, no, look, we're going to we're going to do it whether you like it or not. And it has a big, big cultural ramification. Now look at this graph. This shows Chinese imports of opium. This is basically opium that's going into China and each basically this is representing the tons of this that's coming in in specific years the amount of opium coming into China is we don't we can't even imagine it the the the, the population is addicted to opium well into the communist era when they outlaw it by penalty of death there's you could still find opium addicts in China because of this moment now notice here is hugely addictive now I certainly don't endorse drugs, and I don't want you to go run to my chair and tell him that I'm endorsing drugs. But here's how I've had it explained to me. I talked to a Chinese guy who was addicted to opium. I found him in um, Nanjing. And I asked him, what is it like to smoke opium? What does it feel like? And the way he describes it is he says it's like coming out of every single one of your pores for eight hours continuously. And it's that powerful. It has that strong of it, it for, for a lot of people it is sexual like that it is a sexual thrill it is so strong it is so powerful that people will give up everything in order to get their next hit in order to get a bigger hit in order to get the same feeling that they just had there's lots of reports of of of, of chinese people selling their families their their wives their children in order to just buy more opium and one of the places they do that is in opium dens. These opium dens pop up all along the coast. They pop up all over the place. And they're basically places where people will go and smoke opium. And they are congregation plates of essentially vagrants. I mean, look at this picture. This is a picture of an opium den. These people don't look very healthy. They look malnourished. And the reason is because they don't eat, because they don't feel hunger, because they essentially, their, their mind's tricked into thinking they're still eating. This ruins China. So it ruins China on two parts. 
The first part is the fact that it's addicting millions of their citizens. So millions of their citizens, they're no longer working, they're no longer being productive. Now they're just giving their money to the Europeans in order to get opium. Part of the other thing is all that money that was coming in, remember how we talked about how all this money was coming in for the tea and all this stuff, and they were giving all this raw silver? Well, now the Chinese are paying that all that silver back. They're using the same silver to give back to the Europeans, and so their economy just goes into a huge depression. So it ruins everything. So the Chinese government's like, what are we going to do about it? Their solution is actually very similar to what the Americans do with the British. They would get a bunch of the, the opium and they throw it into the harbor. It's kind of the opium tea party, if you want to think of it that way. But they throw a lot of it, two, point, two and a half million pounds of this. And they basically tell the British, it was illegal anyways, and we're not going to pay you for it. And the British are not happy. The British start what's called the Opium Wars. The British basically say that, yes, we know it's bad, but if your people didn't want to buy it, they wouldn't buy it. And so you have broken international peace treaties, you've broken international law, that's not, that's not allowed. You cannot do that. And so Britain comes back, and they come back with a lot of ships and a lot of soldiers. Now, I want you to understand the Chinese perspective. The Chinese believe that they're able, they should be able to just easily beat these people. They called them the sea barbarians. For, to them, they've never been to Great Britain. Great Britain was a tiny island on the other side of the planet that was inconsequential to their main problems they were dealing with. China expects to be able to wipe the floor with them. They have an incredibly large professional army, and they believe that they're going to be able to wipe the floor with the British. The British comes in, and there's a naval battle between the British Navy and the Chinese Navy, and it lasts about two hours. And every single Chinese ship is in the bottom of the harbor, and all of the European ships are fine. Naval battles usually take a lot longer than that, and they usually have casualties on both sides. The idea is that the Chinese are way behind, and they never knew it until now. It's the 1830s that China starts to realize how far it has really fallen behind. The British are on the verge of getting uh, rifled weapons, which we've already talked about. They're on the verge of getting machine guns. They're on the verge of having steamboats. China, China hasn't even started to industrialize. China wins, or excuse me, Great Britain wins easily, incredibly easily. And it's embarrassing. This is profoundly embarrassing. This is what this, the, the Chinese call this, this the start of the hundred years of humiliation. The, to them, this is such an affront to their culture, an affront to their well-being, to their psyche, that they see this as a, a ruining of what it means to be Chinese. And we'll talk about that in our next, in our next and last slide. But this also brings in the ends of the, the Opium Wars, and you know, we're not going to talk about individual battles, but what you need to know is the Opium Wars are incredibly one-sided, you know, because it's just not even close. Technology. More and more Europeans start to come in. They start to get embassies in Beijing. They start to have more trading ports all over the place. This is what opens up China, and it's what are called the unequal treaties. And this is really bad. This is really bad for the Chinese. Now, I want you to look at this picture, because it's really important. This is a picture. It's actually, well, it's a painting. It's not a picture. I'm stupid. It's a painting of the signing of the Treaty of Nanjing. And the Treaty of Nanjing is what ends the first Opium War. There's another one, but you can think of them as the Opium Wars, because they kind of are similar. The Treaty of Nanjing is signed. Look where it's signed. Look at the, look at the makeup of what's going on here. Most of these people in this picture are Europeans. Most of the people are Europeans. There's kind of like a European dog. There's a European rug in the middle. But notice where they're signing this is what's fascinating about this. It's kind of hard to see, but they actually sign this on board a British vessel, a British ship. They make the Chinese come onto their British, essentially, a super advanced ship and say, look, look how far ahead of you we are. Look how much further ahead we are. You need to sign these unequal treaties. And that's exactly what they are. They're a treaty that is very unfair to the Chinese. Excuse me. The Treaty of Nanjing is devastating. Not only, pardon me, not only is it embarrassing, like we mentioned in the last slide, it does a lot of things that really, really, really influence what's going on in China. The first thing is Hong Kong is now British. The, Hong, the British are like, it's not good enough to give us little ports. We need our own territory where we can conduct business in your country. 
and the Chinese initially balk, but then they're like, we'll just kill you. We'll just fight you more and we'll just take it by force. And so this actually ends up ceding Hong Kong to Great Britain. It's not until the 1990s that this is actually returned back to China. But the two big ones are these two right here. And I'll actually underline them because they're so important. They do two things that really is going to flavor European dominance in China for about 100 years. And the two things are most favored nation status and extraterritoriality. And extraterritoriality is an excellent Scrabble word if you're a Scrabble player. I don't know how you would possibly ever get that in a normal game. But most favored nation status is really remarkable. The Treaty of Nanjing, so both of these are from the Treaty of Nanjing. The Treaty of Nanjing gives Great Britain most favored nation status. That means that if China ever signs another deal that gives concessions to any other country. So let's say, let me excuse me. So they ever sign a deal with any other country, the same, the same terms apply to Great Britain. So if they sign a deal with Korea that says, Korea, you can have a special trading privilege that gives you a, a discount on all of our goods, well, the British get the same thing. If they sign a deal with the Germans that say the Germans can trade in this place, well, the British can do the same thing. This basically gives incredible power to the British in China. The other one is much more serious. It's extraterritoriality. Extraterritoriality is the idea that you will be tried by your nation's, your country's laws rather than the laws of the country you're in. That's essentially what it means. So imagine that you went to Canada, or a better example, imagine that you go to India today and you break some of their laws and they arrest you and they put you up on standing and say, why did you do that? And your defense was, well, it's not illegal in my country. They'd laugh you out of the stage, right? They'd say, that's stupid. You're in our country, you play by our rules. Extraterritoriality is the opposite of that. It's the idea that British people aren't subject to Chinese laws in China. And this is a big problem because it essentially tells the Chinese government, you don't even have enough power to enforce what we're doing in your country. You can't tell us what to do. We have so much power over you. We can break your laws so long as it's not breaking ours. It basically gives the British free reign and to do whatever they want. This sends China into a spiral. China still is very wealthy. They're still very powerful, but they are much less so. And they start to get carved up. More Europeans start to come over, and you can kind of think of them as like thousands of tiny little gnats on a big water buffalo, and they'll eventually kind of take them down. And that's what happens. This is the start of the end for China. It's not until much later that they industrialize and they catch up with the West and the rest. So that's my lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. As I mentioned, we'll have a quiz on this when we come back. Brought easy questions. It'll be basic stuff. But otherwise, I hope you have a really nice fall break, and I'll see you guys on Monday.